Okay, maybe I can start to share my screen. Yeah, I'd like to introduce like for one minute. Uh, introduce you for one minute. Okay. Hi everyone. Uh, today you have Yunzu Lee with us, who is a PhD student in computer science at uh, MIT. Uh, Yunzu has worked on a number of different, uh, very interesting papers, broadly in machine learning and robotics. Some of uh, Yunzu's recent work include uh, causal discovery, uh, visual grounding of physical models, uh, Koopman operators, and a host of other works in model-based RL. So yes, Yunzu, it's yours. Okay, thank you for your kind introduction and thank you for inviting me here. I'm really excited to share some of our recent works to you guys and hopefully uh, we can have uh, fruitful discussions and to synchronize ideas that you have and some of the things that I'm thinking about. Yes. It's good to have thinkings from all different directions such that we can synchronize our ideas and maybe come up with something new. And a little bit about me, like, like as just have been introduced, I'm Yunzhu Li. I'm starting my fourth year PhD at MIT, and I'm currently co-advised by Antonio Taroba and Russ Tedrick. Uh, Antonio is an expert in computer vision, and Russ is an expert in robotics. So my research mainly lies in the directions of combination between vision and robotics. And I have been thinking a lot about the problems in the common areas, like how we can use better vision or better machine learning techniques that can help us to uh, augment the ability of robotics. And my main research directions are lies in two. Uh, one is to use learning-based dynamics modeling to model the dynamics of the environment around us, uh, hoping it can facilitate some downstream tasks, for example, control, system identification, or some other uh, tasks. Uh, I've been also working on multimodal perception, especially combining vision and touch um, to, for manipulation or understanding how human interacting with the environment. I did my undergrad in Peking University and I've been also spending time at uh, Stanford and also at NVIDIA with awesome winter animesh. I see animesh is also here uh, on causal discovery. <laughs> and today I'm gonna talk about the, mainly talk about the Koopman operator work and hope that is helpful. It could be a helpful tool for you guys, like compositionality is very common in our daily life. Many ordinary objects have repetitive subcomponents. For example, soft robots, or for example, robes, Lego blocks, or modeling clay. These uh, objects are known to be very hard to model using classic physics-based methods. If you think about the coffee beans, if you want to use physics-based methods to model the dynamics, you have to con consider that the shape of each one of the coffee beans and you have to consider the contact or detect the contact between uh, each, for example, each pair of them. This is very computationally expensive and uh, sometimes it's even impossible if you think about how you can get the state of these coffee beans from real images. Although for computational methods, for physics-based simulation, it may be hard to model the system or even control them. But if you think about how we human are interacting with our daily objects, for example, if we think about like this, it's very skilled shape playing with eggs, or if we are pasting like butters on our, on our bread, or playing with this like dough. Those amazing techniques of our humans are far beyond the reach of our current robots. They are able to working with deformable objects, working with new objects, working with uh, objects that is very hard to model using uh, physics-based methods. And in order to deal with mismatches, methods, uh, there are generally like two approaches. One is lies in the direction of model-free model -free reinforcement learning. That's basically like a lot of trials and error. This direction of methods is very successful in the game domain, AlphaGo, AlphaStar, as you guys may already be very familiar with, but they are not very applicable when we're thinking about real world tasks and how we can generalize to the real physical environments. That requires a lot of like trans trials and errors that may be impractical or sometimes even dangerous. And to think of it in another way, we humans do not need a lot of trials and error in order to accomplish uh, tasks or accomplish even some new like skillful tasks. 
So this might not be the things that we uh, really want to deploy to the real world. Another direction is to rely on the analytical physics equations to really write down the F equals MA type of physics to describe the environment around us. This direction is actually very, very successful in a lot of domains. For example, if you think about robot locomotions, all of the Boston Dynamics robots are governed, the control of them are governed by their very accurate modeling of the physics. As well as if you think about plane or rockets, those scenarios, you can have a good understanding of the dynamics. Then you can use the dynamics model to guide your optimization of the control signals in order to accomplish your tasks. But when you think about writing down the analytical equations for the uh, environment around us where we want to manipulate or interact in, with in our daily life, it's starting to become challenging. For example, if you want to write down the physics, you have to know the full states of the environment. Otherwise, you won't be able to use physics to predict the futures. But if you think about like, for example, the shirts, or if you want to butter our um, buttons, in those scenarios, it has problems with partial observability. First, you cannot, it's very hard for you to identify the full states. Second, a lot of scenarios, you do not really need the full states to accomplish the task. For example, if you want to button my shirt, I do not have to think about all the like clothes that are behind me or around my, around my back. Instead, we humans do not rely on this. Uh, we, we are, when we accomplish some tasks, we are not thinking constantly about these physical equations. Instead, we rely on heavily on our intuitive understanding of the physics. This actually, this ability, has been developed since we are very, very young, where we, can, we are able to understand the stabilities between like when we're stuck in objects. And this ability is actually is very helpful for, for enable us to do a lot, a wide range of tasks. If you think about our ability to predict the future of the environment, this ability may not be very accurate. If you think about if you are squeezing a sushi or if you are through something over, over some directions, we are not, we cannot be very accurate about long-term predictions. We may be very, have a good intuition about what will happen in our short terms. But still, those short-term predictive ability is already super helpful for doing tasks. So in summary, like in intuitive physics may not have, does not, doesn't have to be accurate, but it turns out to be very useful in our daily activities. So if we want to use intuitive physics, basically what we want to do is to learn the dynamical system from data, from our uh, observations of the environments. Then two questions generally starting to pop up. What should be the state representation and what could be the model class? Uh, a lot of my prior work has been motivated or inspired by this way of thinking. To think about uh, for a specific task, what kind of representation may be good and what kind of models can we use to model the dynamics. For example, some of our prior works are using particles to represent the objects um, using these little dots. Particles are very general and flexible of representing objects of different materials and we can use graph neural networks to learn the interactions between them. And learn, after learning the models, we are able to apply these learned models in order in the real world and to apply some manipulation uh, tasks in order to, for example, mold these deformed materials in our target, into a target shape. Although it's not perfect, but starting to show like this learning-based uh, model can solve, can help us facilitate some fairly complicated tasks. And some other combinations, for example, image patches plus graph neural network. We are able to like model the dynamics in this clever like environments to facilitate some counterfactual reasoning and some of one of our uh, very recent work will be to using like key points based representations as well as using uh, multi-layer perception perception to facilitate some some pushing tasks pushing this box to some target locations and here like the trajectory three as well as trajectory four are some of the more complicated trajectories and also the work I'm, I'm being, I've been working last su summer with Animesh was to using key point and graph neural networks to understand like the causal structures underlying the physical environment to understand how each subcomponents are interacting with each other and what's the type between the, of the interactions.
all of these kind of state representations are in the model classes, as we have already seen in those examples, are suitable for different scenarios and different tasks. And there may not, there may not uh, exist a universal choice that works for all use cases, like for fluids or for rigid objects. The representation may be very different from each other. And if you're using a holistic like representation for all of the objects, it may not be practical or may not be realistic. So it is essential for us to understand advantages and limitations of each one of these model choices in order for us to make the best decisions when we face a new task or new objects. And the work I'm, I'm gonna introduce today, like compositional Kuhnman operators, lies in the category of using object-centric latent vectors to represent like different components inside these environments and using graph neural, net, neural network plus a regularization, which you can think of it as a regularization, this linear dynamics in the middles to facilitate some um, the efficiency of some downstream tasks. Uh, let's make these problems a little bit more formal. Here, we are given observations of a dynamical systems of unknown dynamics, where we are go from xt and ut towards xt plus one. The system dynamic, we only have the observations of these system states, like trajectories of xt, as well as the control signals ut. We have no idea what the dynamics f is. We are no, have no idea what analytical equations inside f is. And here, what we want to do is to do system identification. We want to identify this f or approximate f that can help us to quickly adapt to environments where we are unsure about the physical parameters. The second task is to do control synthesis. Like after we identify the dynamics, how can we synthesize, efficiently synthesize control signals in order to accomplish some uh, downstream tasks? Here we specifically focus on environments that, has, that are compositional where there are subcomponents, uh, which we will be able to show some better generalization abilities by exploring exploits the compositionality inside these systems. Uh, in order to model compositional systems, there are a lot of like prior works, for example, some like graph neural networks. Uh, the neural dynamics can be shown, for example, to model like the contact between balls, like mass moving around, as well as some art articulated objects, like this cheetah, or some particle dynamics that I have shown before. However, the neural dynamics is highly nonlinear. It is actually very hard to adapt to new scenarios. It can be argued that you can maybe, for example, using meta learnings to adapt to new scenarios. Um, but still, that is the challenging task. And for control, uh, after we learn this model, uh, the control synthesized people typically use uh, lies in several categories. One of them is, for example, sampling based methods. People are using cost entropy methods or uh, model predictive path integral. All these methods are based on this learned model and wrote a lot, a huge amount of trajectories. And then you can, uh, you can like uh, filter the trajectories only and by, and update your control signals. Um, some other uh, work are relies on, for example, uh, regards as this learned model as a differentiable simulators and you can perform reinforcement learning on top of these learned models. All these approaches uh, has shown to be good on some scenarios, but it's it still, it's arguably a hard problem. For example, if you are doing samplings, how would you guarantee you can cover the, 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 the space, the, the feasible space where you can achieve the tasks and how you can prevent you, you, you may be arriving into some bad local minimums. So given all these like uh, developments, working with highly nonlinear dynamical system is still a hard task. And this, uh, leads us to think or trying to use the tools of from the Kuhnman operator theory. What the Kuhnman operator theory do is that, sorry, I don't know why it's automatically playing, but yeah. The Kuhnman operator theory basically maps the original, like you can, you, think, you can look at these figures. This is the original dynamics that maps from xt to xt plus one. The Kuhnman operator theory says you can map the original states into some infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Why? Over this infinite dimensional Hilbert space, the dynamics becomes linear. This is, there is a very strong assumptions 
um, to make this like transformation true is that the underlying dynamics of F has to be smooth or at least some degrees of uh, some types of degree differentiable. Um, but in practice, people are because you cannot directly working with infinitely dimensional like uh, space. So in practice, people are trying to find a finite dimensional invariant substate subspace of Y and to define the dynamics over this space. And different people are trying different methods of finding this subspace. Some people are just using some manually designed basis function, like cosine, sine, and different orders of polynomials to represent, trying to represent this um, basis function. Some other people are trying to use like deep learning to use the network, new, to use a new network to find this uh, uh, invariant subspace. For example, in this work published in Nature Communications, uh, by some of the core people from like the Kuma operator theory, you use this uh, use neural networks to find embeddings for this invert for this pendulum, and people from Stanford uh, also use this method to try to model the dynamics of fluids, as well as this group of people uh, from UMich are using Kuma operator theory uh, to control soft robots, and they will be able to show that they can control these soft robots to track like the the contours of the the M, Michigan's M. All of them, all of them are good, but the current development of Kuma operator theory didn't take into account of the compositionality of the systems. So it is easier to adapt or easy to control, but it may be unable to handle compositional systems. So here we have these two group of of methods. One is using graph neural networks that can capture the compositionality of the systems, but sometimes it's hard to adapt and hard to for control synthesis. The Kuma operator theory, where the resulting dynamics is linear, where you can use the linear like control theory to do very efficient adaptation and very efficient control, but currently it is unable to handle compositional systems. So in this work, we're basically trying to combine these two domains and trying to generate these systems to compositional systems, but uh, combine the best of both worlds and you can generate a compositional system and easier to adapt and easy for control. Here, I'm starting with uh, motivating examples of how we may be able to combine uh, these two tools. Here, this motivating example is very simple. It's a system with n balls connected by linear springs and they are moving around according to the spring connected between them. And each one of the balls are defined by its current location and its current velocity. That's the state of this current ball. And the dynamics is actually pretty simple. Like the, the, the first order derivative of the state is basically like its velocity together with the force summed over all the distance of other balls that have connections to this ball. And you can massage the equations to make it like this form. It is basically a matrix times the current states plus the some matrix times the, the states of all other balls. And this can be effectively written as, a, as this blockwise um, equations. Also, please stop me at any moment if you have any questions. And given this blockwise like dynamical systems, we make very simple three observations. The first, for these compositional systems, the system state is composed of the states of each individual object. Like the whole state is the, the concatenation of the state of each one of the objects. And the transition matrix has a blockwise substruct substructure. And the same physical interactions share the same transition block. For example, like the there are linear spring connections between x1 and x2, and that block is shared with the same block that's that's described the interaction that uh, goes from x2 to x3. So given these three observations, we want to inspire our way of designing the compositional Kuhlman operators. First. The Kuma embeddings of the system is composed of the Kuma embeddings of each one of these objects. 
Right? For example, we're given the, uh, the, initial, the current states of the physical system, XT. We use graph neural network to map the current physical system to some object-centric embedding, GT, where each one of the embeddings is correcting to, corresponding to each one of the subcomponents in the original physical systems. And the GT is basically the concatenations of the, of the embeddings of each one of those objects. For anyone who are not, I guess many of, most of you are familiar with graph neural networks. For anyone of you who are not familiar with graph neural networks, it's basically assume the state is composed of some nodes and relations. And for example, there are three nodes and four uh, directed edges. We are using edge encoders to encode each one of these edges into some edge embeddings. And we sum all the income, the embeddings of all the incoming edges for each one of these, all the nodes. And together with the information on the nodes, we derive the node embeddings. And that basically give, give us this object entry embeddings from these input systems, from the input states. Next, uh, we are through, because previously we are talking about like talking about the system without control. But if we want to apply control to these systems, we really have to um, think about how the control comes into play of the uh, of the Kuhnman operator theory. Actually, in the original Kuhnman operator theories, there's no control. And only the, the embeddings of the current states are proven to be able to, uh, to, to have this, uh, this invariant subspace. But in practice, people find that directly like inject these control signals linearly into these embeddings have a fairly good performance. Uh, in describing the dynamics. So we follow this um, common practice by injecting the controls linearly into these in embeddings. And following the second and third observations, like the Kuma matrix has a blockwise substructure. This is uh, fairly obvious given that the object embe in in embeddings are object centric and the Kuma matrix become blockwise and the same physical interactions shall share the same transition block. And blockwise substructure of the Kuhn matrix uh, ensures that the number of parameters that needs to be identified inside this Kuhn matrix, as well as this control matrix, only scales linearly with the number of types of interaction inside these systems, instead, inst instead of with respect to the number of, um, of relations inside the systems. This is an important details that help us to uh, identify the systems fairly efficiently and enable us to generalize to larger systems that are um, never seen during training. Sorry, oh, one quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you decide the architecture of the graph neural network? Like how many nodes to have, uh, etc.? We assume we know like the subcomponents inside these physical systems. So the number of nodes of this graph neural network is the same as the number of subcomponents in the original states. Oh, okay, okay, got it. Um, I also had a question. <clears throat> so in this, do you mean uh, K1N and KN1, KN1 would be the same matrix? So is that, is the, are these submatrices, are these matrices like, if you take the transpose in there, are they the same? Uh, it should be the same if, if for example, like uh, X1 and X2, they have, because this relation is directed, it depends on whether the relations starting from X1 to X2, whether it is the same as the relation starting from X2 pointing to X1. If that's the same, they should share the same sub block. But if oh, okay. X1 and X2, uh, that relation is the same as the relation go from X2 to X3. That's two, that two sub blocks should, shall share the same parameter. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, and then given the predicted object embedding at time t plus one, we use another graph neural networks to decode the physics states as the, as the new time points. And we are going to how we are going to train in this model. If you look, observe these whole systems, we want to identify the K and L first. That's what we uh, call as a system identification stage. 
first let's say we first like randomly like initialize the weights of this graph encoder and the weights in the graph decoders. And given the embeddings of the states and all, as well as the actions all the way from zero to time t. And what you solve for the K and L. And this goes directly is a least square fitting because the dynamics is linear. You can directly use the embeddings to fit the L2 errors between your predictions. That's basically like K times G plus L times U. How is it different from the embeddings at the next time step? So solving a K and L is very efficient and very fast and just like least square fitting to solve to global optimality. And then we want to optimize the parameters inside this graph encoder as well as the graph decoders. We basically have three laws. The first law is autoencoding laws. We want to make sure when we encode the, fit, the system states at time t into this embedding gt and we decode it, it has to be same, same as the input. And then is a prediction loss. What it basically says is that we encode xt into this object centric embedding and we predict forward into the future, like predict, for example, t time steps using, this, using the identified k and l. And, and also decode that into the original state space to see how well that um, reflects the ground truth uh, physical states. We have the third loss, metric loss, because ultimately we want to do control inside this embedding space. And we want to make sure if we minimize the distance inside this, this embedding space, that effectively minimize the distance of the original states. So that's why we have this in metric loss where the distance between the embeddings has to somewhat reflect the distance between the original states. And the total loss is basically the combination of all these three. And at test time, um, our models can support very efficient online adaptation because we can just observe a few trajectories of few time steps of the, of the systems and we can identify K and L. Uh, pretty efficiently. This enables us to adapt to systems where we are unsure about the underlying physical parameters or physical parameters that are outside the range of the training. And for control, it's also very simple. Like given the current encodings of the states, and for example, some target states, the encoding of target states, as well as identified K and L, the dynamics is linear. We can define the distance between the predicted embeddings as well as the target embedding. This could be some L2 distance between them. Then this problem is, is effectively uh, quadratic programming that can be solved to global optimalities um, uh, fairly simply. Fairly simply. <clears throat> and here I'm gonna show you some exper experimental results. Uh, we are considering like three environments. First environment, if you shake a rope, where we have control authorities to the top mass of this rope and all the remaining masses are free to move. And two other like soft robots environments where we are, first we are controlling this soft robot to swing. And this robot is fixed to some like spatial locations and different colors indicates like different tissues. For example, this um, gray or blue color indicates like this tissue is soft. And this means this is a uh, rigid tissues. And the red means it is currently, it has actuators inside. It is currently con contracting. And the green means it also has an actuator inside, but it's currently expanding. And here is another environment, still like colors indicating the same actions, but uh, they are swimming inside a, inside a, like a simulated or fake fluid. The reason we want to add these two environments, these soft robots, is to really want to show like our method can generalize to robots of different configurations or config configurations that are never seen before. For example, we are randomly generating like the shape of these robots and randomly assigns like those tissue, those tissue blocks inside this uh, shape. If our model can do that, that is, is, a, is an interesting levels of generalizations. And we also want to see whether it can generalize to like shapes that are larger than during training. First is the simulation results of the rope. First row is our predictions. This is purely open loop rollouts. We are only given 
the first, the initial state, as well as the subsequent action trajectories. And we are rollouting in this linear space, as well as decode that into the original state space and to make the visualizations. And uh, we are comparing, sorry, we are comparing with the uh, with the ground truth. As you can see, when it goes further into the futures, the robe starting to deviating um, to some extent. But uh, go back to uh, the argument at the beginnings. The model doesn't have to be super accurate in order to accomplish the tasks as long as it can make some reasonable future predictions. Also, I want to uh, also emphasize, if you naively or directly linearize our original systems, it will very quickly deviate from, some, from the points you linearize over. And this um, uh, predictive ability clearly shows uh, the, um, the regions of attraction or the valid linearized regions is much larger than directly linearized over the original dynamics. And here are some control results. Here the task is when the countdown goes to zero, we want uh, the rope to uh, map to some targets like states. And the target state is shown in red. Here we show like <clears throat> it can generalize the same model, doesn't need retrain. And we can identify the K and L. That it has it's re, it's identified the K and L directly from some of the vision data and unit K, K and L. We can optimize the, the control signals to achieve this task. One thing to note is that for these six environments, the first, the lengths are different. Second, the physical parameters are different. For example, the stiffness of the rope as well as the gravity of the environments. For these things, our work has already shown some uh, good generation abilities to uh, and also on the adaptation abilities. Next, I will show some the software wall swing results. Here, the, the first row is the, our prediction and the second row is the ground truth. You, you will see like there are different configurations as well as different combi uh, combinations of, of different like sub blocks. Here we show still the task is when the countdown go to zero, want to achieve the target states showing showing red grids. And our our model can do a reasonably good job. Without retrain, we can adapt to like environments with different physical parameters. Also in these six environments, the stiffness of these soft blocks are also different from each other. So it has to perform some online adaptation. And the final environment is about soft robot swing. Um, still, like when the countdown to zero, it wants to achieve some target states. And all the codes are available. You can reproduce the results uh, by, by running the codes uh, on our GitHub uh, repos. We also have some like uh, quantitative results. First is about like the qualitative like predictions uh, over time you'll be able to see like our models uh, outperform some baselines where interaction network, propagation networks that are learning based graph neural network that are fully nonlinear. When thinking about adapting to environments where you are unsure about the physical parameters, our work ac actually, this square fittings is better than performing like several rounds of gradient descents on this new data. We also compare with uh, a baseline called like Kuhn KPM that's basically still like Kuma operator um, models, but that use like hand-designed uh, basis function instead of using neural networks. And here are some control results when we compare with, uh, with the manually designed basis functions. And also here we are showing population studies to see how our model is sensitive to the number of samples that used to identify the, the transition matrix K and L. Uh, turns out not very sensitive. All of them seem to work in reasonably fine as show their overlap with each other. We're also operating on the dimension of the object century embeddings. Also, like different choices seem to overlap with each other pretty much. So we didn't really like push this model to a limit where we want to see what's the smallest amount of capacities that the model has to maintain in order to make good prediction. We didn't push in that direction, but it seems that maybe we can have a fairly small models. Uh, for us to do some reasonably good prediction. 
And here are some operation study on whether we enforce the, the like the relations of the same, uh, like the relation interactions of the same type that shares the same uh, block. For example, here we are comparing with the block with the transition matrix that only has diagonal blocks, and with like the a baseline where we are not enforcing any structures over the transition matrix. It seems like by in, by enforcing some of the structures on the transition matrix, our method performs the best. And here I'm going to the summary. Like here we propose to combine graph neural networks and Kuhnman operator theory. Our formulation generalizes to compositional structures of the underlying systems and generalizes to systems with variable numbers of components and systems with different configurations. And the internal linear structure allows it to quickly adapt to systems of unknown physical parameters by directly doing like least square regressions and can enable efficient control synthesis using quadratic programming. Also, I, I also like <coughs> uh, promise I will discuss like the limitation of this Kuhnman operator theory. Actually, there are very strong like limitations of Kuhnman operator because of the underlying assum assumptions. Kuhnman operator theory assumes like the underlying dynamics is smooth or at least a few times differentiable. And we actually tried very hard to trying to use this Kuhnman operator return models to model hard contact. Uh, although it is not supported by the original theory, but our hope was it can learn some soft contact by learning from hard contact models. It can learn that like, like some soft contact models may be used by, for example, Mujuko, but we didn't su really succeed in that direction. <clears throat> so, but still, if you think about a lot of like real world uh, tasks, for example, if you want to push in boxes or, or, or poking this object to make it rotate, that involves a lot of hard contacts. For those scenarios, I'm not really sure where the Kuhnman operator series can really, um, really give us the, 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 the expected performance gain. <clears throat> but still, uh, also like, for example, the example I showed in this paper, like so the rope for the soft robots. And if you're thinking about some other, like for example, deformable objects uh, or fluid granular materials or clothes or rope, for those scenarios, maybe Kuhnman operator theories can help us um, better capture the model that can facilitate more efficient system identification and control. <clears throat> and it may it also it will be an interesting question that how we can combine, because in this work, we are directly operating on the states of the original systems. And we are not really directly working on the images. And how we can, for example, go from images, extract some state some reasonable state representations for example key points or particles or some other like uh, representation and using that representations combined with Kumar operator theory to see how far they can go in the real world could be an inter interesting future directions and also ha as i have showed in the in the rope environments it can rule out to a fairly like like long futures but still it cannot uh, when it's, it's very long, for example, 100 time steps into the futures, it started to deviate. But it has already show a very uh, strong abilities to have very large regions of attractions when you assume that when you want the model is linear. So maybe this model can be extended to piecewise affine models. This can address two issues. First, it can uh, use much fewer pieces to cover the entire state space. And when it goes from like, too far away from the initial, it can also split between pieces to maintain like the uh, modeling errors. And when you think about the uh, contacting, for example, the, the hard content I'm describing as one of the limitations, if you are using piecewise of fine models, uh, you can model different contacting like configuration, configurations using different like Kuhnman models. That way you will be able to uh, handle those hard contacts. Because for example, if you are pushing something, uh, there are two phases. You are not in contact, that could be a linear model, linear Kuhnman models. And when you are in contact, that could be another uh, uh, linear Kuhnman models. In these cases, just two pieces may be able to model the dynamics very good. <clears throat> so this has some potential features. And another thing maybe we can think about is how we can augment uh, this Kuhnman operator models with policy functions or value functions. Because now I'm using like 
quadratic programming to solve for the control sequences. But still, when the sequences go to longer, the, the solve time becomes linearly like, longer. So if you are thinking about combining this like latent embeddings with some policy functions or value functions, maybe we can uh, arrive into some more efficient um, control synthesis. And if you think about, because the dynamics is linear, the policy functions and the value functions doesn't need to be a very complicated neural network. It's just a simple intuition, but that, that doesn't necessarily be true. But this intuition tells us maybe some very like uh, simple function classes can do the trick. And also um, people in, in the more interesting theoretical things can also can think about how we can uh, uh, probe the discrepancy between the nerd Kuhnman space and the original st state space. And what does it mean to have a good control sequences that minimize the distance between the embeddings in the Kuhnman space? What does that mean with respect to the original state space? And how we can constrain the loss between these two spaces may be an interesting direction to see. And at the end, I want to show these videos again. I think really these videos inspired a lot of my research as well as uh, the goals of my research agendas to really want to enable these robots to do a lot of dexterous uh, uh, manipulations with a lot of a wide range of different materials directly from visions. And I want to thank for all my collaborators. The first line, like how Jadrin, Dina, and Antonio are the author of these papers. And here are the, the, the second and third row are the collaborators uh, I, I, I worked with for the past few years, where I'm highly inspired by them uh, in fulfilling my, a lot of my PhD projects. And that's end of my talk. And thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Enzo. Uh, great presentation. I think we have some time for uh, questions. If anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. So I have a, I have a question. I don't know. Hey, Yuzhu. Hi. Thanks for the great talk. Um, Thank you. I don't know if you covered this because I came a bit late to the to the talk, but uh, I was wondering if your piecewise affine uh, model, uh, if you were to implement it, do you think it would cover also cases where uh, your original system has more than one uh, attractor. So Koopman, the Koopman operator is going to try to uh, map embed your system into a space where uh, the uh, the linear the system is going to be linear. So it's going to have uh, at most one attractor. Uh, whereas if the original dynamical system has more than one, that there might be some loss uh, in that approximation. Uh, so do you think this piecewise model is going to help address that? Or how do you think we can best address that? Yeah, definitely. Like, this is also like one limitations of this Kuhnman operator theory. Because a lot of times when people are talking about like the Kuhnman operator theories, they talk about they want to learn a global model for the whole systems. But that's, that's not necessarily true, at least from a lot of my experiences, because a lot of systems that may have a lot of like different, like, like, um, uh, Different, 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 like uh, this attracting regions, like the, the, and we may balance between diff on different points. Uh, this piecewise of I, uh, ideas, I think, could potentially address these issues. Um, I've also discussed this with Russ. Uh, he is like the expert in like using a lot of like piecewise of I models, yeah. and we really believe like because like using Kuma operator theories, the linearized regions would be much larger than the original direct and naively linearized over the original dynamical space. Now how we may mm -hmm. be able to like, for example, like uh, decouple the state space to have different pieces or have the least amount of pieces where the, the Kuma operator models uh, loss are bounded within some regions. Maybe mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. a very interesting like research project to, to work with. Mm -hmm. Would you also have to learn at the same time the transition conditions from one region to the next, or uh, does that come with a way that you partition? You would partition the the state space. That's a that's an interesting point. Yes, um, how you are transition between different regions. That's <clears throat> that's definitely a very important pieces uh, inside these models. Um, my current guess would be. 
maybe you can have an explicit detector, like which pieces you are in. Maybe that's the most simplest way. If you want to embed that into the, and that's, gives, and for example, if you want to optimize, you can do some like missing general programming to solve for, for, if you want to model the system like that. But if you want to directly learn the transition between the integer, integer pieces, mm, I, I'm not re really sure because, for example, maybe you can think of some neural network to do that thing. But if you want to write some this, this linear like approximation, I don't think that can solve this like discrete transition. Great, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I have one more question. So again, this is um, a broader question rather than technical details. So how does this line of work compare to something like, let's say people have done this latent controllable embedding work. Uh, there's this line of work by, I think, DeepMind uh, and a few others in Italy. Uh, there's this new algorithm or algorithmic framework called Control Aware Representation Learning. Uh, and uh, what they do is something very similar. Their argument is we can learn a state representation where uh, this thing is linear, although uh, linearity is not guaranteed in that sense. They just sort of model it like that. and. Uh, uh, um, so, so how does it compare in that sense? Like, how would you say a formalization uh, using Koopman operator theory is better or worse uh, than these other models, which are not, and, and in general, right? They will solve some of the problems that Koopman theory is not solving, for example, contact and stuff, uh, but they will not have any guarantees. Uh. Mm. I guess also in our cases, we cannot give any guarantees. Like, Kuma observer theory only gives guarantees when the Kuma embedding space is an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. People are always trying to find some finite dimensional approximation of that infinite dimensional like Kuma space. This kind of approximations uh, may be enough for some specific type of system, but in general, it, it is not enough to uh, directly guarantee that linearities the global linearities. So in these cases, uh, you always rely on some optimization methods that's um, trying to minimize some losses. Uh, for example, in our cases, the autoencoding losses and the future prediction losses. Uh, a lot of like, for example, embed to control and this, this con con control aware, this embedding learning, um, also use very similar losses. And what I guess is maybe the performance is actually very similar. Um, but a lot of the details in how you learn the dynamical systems may result in different capabilities of the systems. For example, uh, something we have tried is uh, we are not fitting the KNL uh, during the training stage. Instead, instead, we have a global KNL. And if we have a global KNL, everything is uh, end to end differentiable and you can solve it to, uh, you do not have to do any like this square fit. Also, uh, in our cases, this square fitting is, is also like you have analytical solutions in our cases that can be also made into and differentiable uh, during the training of these neural networks. Um, what I'm just saying is that different design choices and how you define the losses may have a great impact on the final performance of your models. And for different cases or different tasks, tasks uh, those design choices may be different. For example, if you want to uh, handle contacts, maybe you have to have some very explicit um, uh, the notice of whether you are in contact or different contacting modes in order to uh, have an accurate model that can predict the futures. Um, also, as I kind of working through this, uh, this lines of work, my general feeling is that because we are using neural networks and graph neural networks, there are a lot of seemingly random design choices you can choose between. And sometimes that can, uh, that, that is a good thing. Sometimes that is uh, a bad thing where you have to try a lot of different things to see which one works better. And sometimes those design choices doesn't really matter. And I find it hard to really find a very principled like theoretical guide, guide, guideline to tell us how I should design the model. It's still primarily, primarily, primarily based on what I want the model to do. And I try to see whether this kind of design choices that can enable those abilities works. And maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. 
and that enough of what I what I what I am having. I'm guessing maybe they are also exper experiencing some very similar thing. Um, yeah, <laughs> hope that's somewhat answer your question. Yes, yes, I think so. Uh, any other questions? I have um, one more. That other people don't. Please, please go go ahead. Okay, so um, all of these, so coupon operator uh, theory and other types of, um, you know, more recent uh, variational methods for discovering latent state, typically re rely on reconstructing the the observation. Mm -hmm. um, and there have been a, a number of recent papers that do not try to do that. Um, so they try to uh, have contrastive losses for learning the state space. Um, I'm wondering if you've thought about those uh, and if there is any hope of making them compositional. I see, I see. Actually, I have been thinking about um, how contrastive learning can be used and whether contrastive learning is can be regarded as the objective, the final objective you want to optimize, or it's, it's merely a auxiliary functions yeah. that in, encourage those, those embeddings to have a nicer, like for example, distribution over the manifolds. Exactly. <clears throat> um, my current thinking is that if we want to, still, I think it still highly depends on the tasks. For example, in the real world, there may be a lot of like, for example, background noise or things that are not modeled by the dynamics. For example, people walking around, people walking by, those things may need to be ignored when you are doing the doing the dynamics learnings that's so in this cases reconstructing the original observations may not be a very good idea because all of all of those like unmodeled factors that will like ruin the training process and in that case maybe some contrasting learning that can enable us to uh, arrive into an embedding space that is very robust to some uh, unmodeled like noise factors uh, in terms of this compositionality, this compositionality plus like contrasting learning, I actually think because currently contrasting learning are contrasting, for example, within a batch mm. or within uh, with time time sequences. But you have this compositionalities in these original states. The choice of contrasting of things to contrast uh, increases. Uh, you can contrast it as the current time step of different components inside these systems. Um, but still, like those choices seem to be uh, still a bit arbitrary to me. Like whether you're contrasting only spatially or only temporally or both spatial temporally or within a batch. Uh, I do not have a very good intuition okay. of which one works better or which one works for which cases. Maybe it's still like trials and error <laughs> to figure yeah. out how to do this. Gotcha. Or if you have a good intuition, uh, I'm, I'm happy to know. <laughs> I don't think I have a better intuition than that, sorry. But it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a speculative question. Yeah, it's a good question. Thanks. <laughs> good. I guess if there are no more questions, uh, let's thank Yunzu once again. Thank you for the awesome talk. I'll stop recording now. <laughs>